Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. Well, good morning. In the Old Covenant, the people of God, namely Israel, were immersed in a, in a very rich and extensive system of worship. It touched every aspect of their lives. From the time of their childhood, they would have been exposed to all of the ceremonial religion that was in the Mosaic Covenant, all of the rich traditions uh, that existed within the covenant. For the faithful, all of these traditions would have pointed them to Yahweh, to, to God, and they would have come to depend in, in love and feel a certain warmth with the rhythm of the traditions and the ceremonial aspects of the Mosaic law. These traditions, again, they were holistic. They were integrated into every aspect of life, worship, school, home life, marriage, children, civic life. It was all one. There was no separation of God and, and culture. It was all together. It was all under the, the lordship of Yahweh. The sacrificial system reminded them of their sins. And the Day of Atonement, Every year was a profound day where they would repent and acknowledge their need for forgiveness and their need for a substitute. They had Sabbath days, fasting days, Sabbath weeks and fasting weeks. All of this was centered again around God and God's people and family. There was no distinction the feasts would have been filled with laughter and joy and dancing and wine and merriment. And the fasting days would have been filled with God's word and worship and repentance. They had a beautiful rhythm of life and it was all centered around the temple. Oh, the temple. The temple would have been a beautiful place to be. The teaching of God's word, the sacrifices, the, the worship, the, the coming together of the congregation of Israel, and not to mention the structure of the temple was magnificent. It was beautiful. The Old Testament faith was a very tangible faith. You could touch it. You could smell it. You could hear it. It was, it was there. It was, it was right in front of them. And here we have in Hebrews uh, 12, I'm going to read from you at, from the end of Hebrews. Uh, there's an argument happening all throughout the book that, that the Israelites, um, the, the Christian Jews that this book is written to, were looking back to the comfort of what I just described. Of course, they were being persecuted, and that played into it, but they were also looking back with nostalgia. And they kept looking back. And the writer of Hebrews is, is urging them, no, look forward. The, you're looking back to the sign. The sign was pointing to Jesus. And here we have at the end of the book of Hebrews, the writer says this, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire in darkness and gloom and a tempest. Then he goes on, and I'm going to skip a few verses. But you have come to Mount Zion, into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, into the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, into God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. One of the essential 
arguments and context of the entire book of Hebrews is, is right here. He's telling them, you, you, you keep longing for, for what can be touched and what you had, the comfort of what you had, but, but you've come to Mount Zion. You've come to, to the city of the heavenly Jerusalem, and it can't be touched, at least for now. It can't be touched. And brothers and sisters, that is you. That is me. That is us. We have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. And we can taste it now, and one day we will touch and smell and, and take part in it. But for now, we take it by faith. So as a result, these Jewish Christians, they, they believe the gospel. They, they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe, and they leave it all behind. All of the, the worship and the beauty and the rich texture of their, their old faith, they leave it all behind. They accept it with joy. In fact, in the book, um, it says, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. And again, this is a theme that runs throughout the whole book of Hebrews. You're going to see it in, in chapter 11 that they were looking forward to the heavenly city, not the city made by man. Isn't this the truth, though? Brothers and, and sisters, when you first come to faith, you, you may come to faith with, with lots of joy. Lots of joy. The beginning is much easier to turn away from everything, but as you live the life of faith, you experience persecution and trials. And of course, you're still sinful. You still become dull of hearing at times. The darker days get us doubting. The sin that we enjoy darkens the eyes of our hearts. And we can begin to get nostalgic and we can look back, and I don't know what that is for you. You can look back. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an old way that you expressed your faith. And you look back and say, hey, there was something comfortable there. Just like the Israelites, they look back to Egypt. They look back to their slavery at one point, and they said, oh, we had garlic and onions and leeks. We had good food. Yeah, we were in, enslaved, but we had some things. And brothers and sisters, I, I would just submit to you that that is a natural part of the, the, the sinful human heart to look back into in nostalgia of the things that you left behind. It's interesting, as I was putting together the, the, the last few sermons and kind of thinking about um, when Hebrews was written, so it was probably written you know, in, in 50, 55, 60, 65 AD, somewhere in that time frame. Um, and if you know anything about history, uh, the temple that they were looking back at, the temple that they were looking back at with fondness was completely destroyed in AD 70. It's as if God wiped it out and said, hey, you're, you're my people, don't look back to that. That's the sign Christ is the substance. Today, we're going to look at an interesting character. Um, you've heard about him a bit. We talked about him this summer in Psalm 110, and he's popped in and out um, of the last maybe five weeks. This is Melchizedek. Um, going to give you a little background on Melchizedek before we get into the text. Uh, Genesis, in the book of Genesis, and in particular chapter 13 in the book of Genesis, Abraham and his nephew Lot are, are together at that point, and they look around and they say, whoa, we, we have a lot. We have a lot of possessions. We, this land can't support both me and you, Abraham and Lot, and Abraham's people and Lot's people, so they decide to separate. And it's not too long after they separate that a few kings capture Lot and his people. And Abraham hears about it, and he says, I'm going to get him. I'm going to go get 
Lot, he takes 318 of his men and just goes into battle. And he fights, and he gets Lot, and he gets all the people back, and he gets all the possessions back. And this is where Melchizedek enters the story. So that's, that's the context. Let's go to Genesis 14, 17 to 20. The, the writer of Hebrews is coming right out of, right out of Genesis here, so we're going to go right to the, to the text. It's talking of Abraham here. After his return from the defeat of Shedelomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. That's it. That's, that, that's all Genesis says about Melchizedek. He blesses Abram, Abraham, and Abraham tithes to him, a tenth of all the, the spoil. He comes out of the, on the scene, seemingly out of nowhere, and we don't hear about him again until Psalm 110. One thousand years go by. You see Melchizedek? David picks it up in Psalm 110. Four, here it is. David is talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. And he says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Here, pick up the oath here from, we talked about oaths last week. Here's another oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then no mention about Melchizedek for the rest of the Bible until Hebrews. And we have to wonder, what, why? Well, why? Why does the writer of Hebrews pick up on Melchizedek and, and think that he is such an important figure to talk to these Jews who are thinking about turning back to their faith before Christ? Why Melchizedek? And we're going to get into that today, and I hope by the power of the Holy Spirit that I can say something of worth um, to, to your heart and to your mind. Um, let's go back to chapter Five, if you can remember, uh, he, he's going, he's flowing about the high priesthood, the, the author of Hebrews. He's talking about Jesus as a high priest. And he says this, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Again, talking about Jesus, he was made perfect. He's the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then we go into our warning, right? He says, and about this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. So you heard two weeks of warnings, and then an encouragement, and then he's going to pick the text up as if right from verse 11 right to chapter 7, verse 1. If you were to read the text in that way, read Hebrews 5 to 11, skip all the warnings and encouragement, and go right to 7, 1. It's his, his thought process is just like he's on Melchizedek. He just wanted to stop and rebuke them and warn them in the middle of it because he, he, he says, hey, you're, you're probably not going to understand this, um, but you should. So seven, uh, two, one, one uh, and two, the beginning of two. Here we go. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the God most of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. So we we just read this. In Genesis, this is simple. So the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, um, Jesus is in the order or after the order of Melchizedek. He is like 
in some way like Melchizedek, and I'm going to give you a little spoiler, what, what he is fighting against is the Levitical priesthood that all these Christians, uh, Jewish Christians, were looking back and saying, oh, that priesthood was beautiful. Oh, I remember the robes and, and uh, the, the Levites and, and the incense and the smells and, and the bells. And they're looking back towards the, the Mosaic law. So part of the author's argument here, you got to get this, is he's going to say, hey, Jesus is not in the order of Aaron. He is not coming from the law of Moses. He is coming before that. And he's using this Melchizedek figure to show that. One of the things that we have to understand is is students of the Bible. And I would say we're all students of the Bible. If you call yourself a Christian, um, you you are a student of the Bible. You may be a good student. You may not be a a, a good student, but you're you're a student of the Bible. If you're hearing the word, reading the word, um, that is you. And um, one of the things that is happening here in this text, and one of the things that is all throughout this book, is something called typology. Types and anti-types. Let me give you an example. The temple was a real structure. It existed. But the temple is a type It's pointing forward to something much greater than itself. Let me give you an example of that. The temple was the place where God, his presence, dwelt. It was also the place of sacrifice. It was also where priests would enter the holy place with blood. It was the place where sinful men and women met with a holy God. If that sounds like anybody in particular, you're thinking in in the right vein, that is Jesus Christ, who in the Gospels calls himself the temple. He is the sacrifice. He is the high priest. So the temple is a type pointing to the anti-type Jesus. You have these all throughout the Bible. Jonah, three days in the belly of the, the fish. And what does Jesus say? He, he, he relates that to himself, that he'll be three days in, in the earth. Paul says Adam was a type of Christ. The flood in First Peter, um, or Peter relates the flood to baptism. In John 6, Jesus says that manna, that bread that was falling from heaven in in the Old Testament, in the wilderness, he says, I I am the bread. So the bread is the the type, and Jesus is the anti-type. The the Bible is full of this. If you don't get this concept, you'll miss a lot of truth that the Bible is speaking to us. Types and anti-types, they're all over the Bible. And here is my point. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. He is a type of Christ. And the writer of Hebrews, is, it, all throughout this book, is again, he's dealing with types. It's going to get really thick. He's going to be talking temple and sacrifice here in a few weeks. Melchizedek is a type of Christ. A quote from uh, Graham's, Graham Goldsworthy on types. He says this, In the purpose of God, he provides a preparatory shadow of the real saving events. Just, I want to stop there. The name of the series is From Shadow to Substance. So this is, the, the whole idea of this book is there was a shadow in the Old Testament. It's pointing to the, the substance in the new. The relationship between the type And the fulfilling anti-type is such that grasping the shadow in the Old Testament by faith, believing the promises of God was the means by which the people of the Old Testament grasped the salvation which was to come in Christ. They are a preparation for and anticipation of 
the definitive word and act of God in Christ. So that, again, that this is going to be a major theme for the next five weeks, types, anti-types. It's just, I know this can sound kind of chunky, but it's something that makes sense. Trust me, we, we need to, to understand this. So I would just press you a little. When you read the Bible, how do you read it? Do you, do you look for, for, for types? Can you read the Old Testament and see Jesus in it? Of course, this can go way off the rails. There, there's ways to, to, to make this um, just completely not what it's supposed to be. But there is a beauty in the Old Testament that is showing us what is to come. All right. And this, by the way, is what Jesus means when he says, you search the scriptures, talking to the Pharisees, and you, in them you think you have life, but it is they that bear witness about me. This is what he means. There, there's prophecy that's talking about Christ's coming, but there's types that are just playing out and showing you the salvation to come. All right, back to Melchizedek and back to our text. Here we go. Of Melchizedek, the author is going to say, he is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever." few things here. His name, Melchizedek, in the name, in the Hebrew, you have the word for king, Melech, and Zedek, righteousness. So by his name, he's the king of righteousness. And by his position, he is the king of Shalom, Salem, peace, Jerusalem. So there's a lot of connections going on here, but I want to draw your attention to the, the, what's going on here and the, the type. Let's go to Isaiah 9, 7, a very familiar verse of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah prophesying of the increase of his government and of peace, right? Jesus is the king of peace. There will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So let's go back to our character here that just comes out of the scene, out of, out of nowhere, Melchizedek. He is the king of Salem, the king of peace, and he is the king of righteousness, who is also a priest. So Melchizedek is a priest King, and if we look at his name, the name is, is, is very close to our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we talked about in past sermons, um, in the Mosaic Law, you could not be a priest and a king. They were separate offices. We had kings, you had priests, and you had prophets. All three of those come together in Jesus, but Melchizedek held the kingship and the priesthood. The text also says that he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So this part of Scripture is probably where people get, I think, off the path on who Melchizedek is. You may be in here, and if you, you have another understanding of Melchizedek, that, that's fine. Um, but some people think that he was pre-incarnate Christ, um, and they would point to this verse. There's other theories, but, but the two major theories are Melchizedek was either pre-incarnate Christ or he was a type of Christ. And again, I'm arguing that he was a type of Christ because I think that's what the author of Hebrews is doing the entire book, is arguing from typology to anti-type. 
The other reason I, I don't think Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate Christ is it's right there in the text. It says he, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So I think if he was the Son of God, the text would have more clearly said he was the Son of God. But the text doesn't say that. It says he is resembling the Son of God and he continues a priest forever. So what do we do with, well, he's without father or mother and without genealogy. Why, why is that there? And, and here is my best, um, my best effort to tell you why that's there. The Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood relied on genealogy. It was all about who were you born under? Are you a Levite? If you're a Levite, you can serve. And by the way, you can only serve from 20 to 50. In fact, we, we have this story in Ezra when, when Cyrus lets the people of God go, go back to rebuild the temple. He sends them back and, and apparently there's a, a group of, of men who want to get into the priesthood. Here. Hey, we're, we're back in the Holy Land. We're back to the temple. Uh, I'm going to take my, you know, I'm, I'm going to um, maybe throw my hat in the ring for, for this priesthood thing. And we have this scene in Ezra. Ezra 2, verse 62. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there. And so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. If you were to be a priest in the Old Testament law, your genealogy, your birth certificate, whatever they used back then, had to be under the tribe of Levi. So I think that the author of Hebrews is saying he's without father or mother. He's without genealogy. He, he, this is not a priest in the Levitical order. This is something entirely different, pointing to something entirely bigger. He continues a priest forever. There's no record of his birth. There's no record of his death. So I think the rest of our text, the argument is, is very simple. As is, is intricate and, and maybe confusing as it can get of who is this Melchizedek? Why is he here I think the argument is this simple, and I'm going to state it, and then we'll read the rest of the text and get to some application. I will get to application um, today. Here's the argument. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, the patriarch, who you guys all look to as Father Abraham, right? We know from the Gospels that, that Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees and they're constantly saying, Abraham's our father. We don't want anything to do with you. Abraham's our father. They, they, they held Abraham up on, on a, on, and rightly, he was the, the patriarch. But the writer of Hebrews here is saying, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And Levi was a great grandson of Abraham, therefore Abraham is greater than Levi. And Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek because Melchizedek is greater, and the greater Melchizedek blessed the lesser Abraham. So what is all this stuff about this priesthood that you want to go back to? Jesus is not in that order. He is not in the Levitical order. He is in the order of Melchizedek. Let's read the rest of our text and you'll, you'll see. It's, it's, you may, it's really very simple. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So stop right there. Abraham has the promises of God. 
This makes Abraham great. We, we, we know Abraham's life. He had the promises. God spoke to him. But yet, this man, Melchizedek, comes out of nowhere, and Abraham acknowledges him as the greater. All right, let's go on. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. I'll just say right now, if, if, if we weren't preaching through a book of the Bible, I would not have chosen this text. Um, it is a text that, that you, it, it's got a highly um, Jewish first century context to it. Um, and, and that's how we have to read the Bible. We need to remember that. Like we, we're, this is um, a writer who is, again, talking to Jews, looking to, 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 to revert to, to Mosaic law. They would have known who Melchizedek was. You know, for us, like, we're Melchizedek, Melchizedek, who, who were we talking about? Why, pastor, why are you up here talking about Melchizedek? But the bottom line is this. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, and Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. That's it. That's the bottom line of this entire argument. I'm going to guess that zero of you are tempted to go back to the Mosaic law. The ceremonial law, the sacrifices, the temple worship, I'm going to guess that that's not something you're struggling with. But I do know that you're tempted to go back to something. I do know that. We're human. Our hearts are restless. We can see God move mighty one day and the next day walk away. We are so much like the Israelites who saw him part the Red Sea and then grumbled three days later. That is us. We have to acknowledge that. But I would ask you this morning to to get to the the bottom of, of this. What causes you to look back? What are you looking back to? Maybe it's something nostalgic. You know, a lot, a lot of us, uh, especially in the, the Northeast, in, in this area, especially in, in, in Syracuse and the surrounding area, we have Catholic backgrounds. Um, there, there are kind of flavors of that temple in, in the Catholic background. And I've talked to, 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 to ex-Catholics who have said, yeah, there's something that, that I felt comfort in, in that. And I would just ask, is, but is the gospel being preached? Because the kingdom that we come to is a heavenly kingdom. Mount Zion is heavenly. We can't touch it right now. We can't see it right now. But it's real. In fact, all the things that we see, all the the worldly things that we see that that point to to God are just copies and, and shadows of the real, and we're, we're gonna, the author's going to go there and, and, and as the weeks progress. But again, what, what causes you to doubt? What are you looking back to? What gets in the way of your faith? What entangles you? Maybe you're somebody that just needs the affirmation of people, and being a Christian is just too hard because you don't get affirmation being a Christian. 
Maybe it's a certain lifestyle that you know the scriptures condemn and, and you want that lifestyle. There's a certain sin and, and you just, um, you, you're kind of walking away from it, but you're kind of tethering yourself to it. You're, you're, you're not um, fully just repenting and, and turning your back on it and walking away from it. I don't know what that thing is for you. I know what those things are in my own life and and I have to fight them and I have to put them to death and and repent and and look to God and not look back. Jesus says that we put our hand to the plow in the kingdom and we, we don't look back. Don't look back. I feel like I can... There, there, there are certain times that I stand up here and, and there's opinions, and then there's certain times that I can say something with all the confidence in the world because I know the Bible attests to it. And here's what I want to say. This is not my opinion. I feel as though I can say this with all authority and confidence. Whatever it is that you are toying with to look back Burn the boats, if you know what that means. Burn the boats, repent, walk away from it, and look to the Lord. You will not be disappointed. You will not be disappointed. The deep longings of your heart can only be satisfied in God, in the Father, through Jesus those longings, those, those things in your heart that, that one day it's, hey, I don't like my house, and the next day it's, a, I'm not happy with my spouse, and the next day it might be your kids, oh, may, maybe it's your job, oh, maybe you're not making enough money. All of those grumblings, they're just manifestations of the fact that your heart needs to settle and be content in Christ no matter what your situation is. Brothers and sisters, there is no other way. Jesus says of himself, he is the door. He is the door. And and the the writer of Hebrews is talking about this, the holy of holies and and the throne room of God and, and the place where God exists, which was behind the curtain. And there's gonna, again, be a lot of talk about this in the upcoming weeks but, but that is the place, that is what your heart is longing for, to be with God, to experience God. And Jesus Christ is the only one who can bring you there. There is no other way. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he is the door, he is the, the bread from heaven, he's the living water, he's the resurrection, he's the life, he is the Son of God. The writer of Hebrews, towards the end of Hebrews, says this. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, this, this, is, this is it. This is, again, he, the holy places. We can enter those. You couldn't enter those before. You can't enter those without the Son of God, without the sacrifice. You can't have the Father without the Son. But we have confidence by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. Again, he's that curtain that separated God's holiness from sinful man. Jesus tears it, tears it down. That is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You can have confidence to approach the Father through Christ. But whatever it is that that you're flirting with and and toying with, that's getting you to look back, don't look back. Don't look back. Look towards 
Christ. We're about to sing one of my favorite songs, All Glory Be to Christ. And there's a line in the beginning that says, to you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me what is your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn, all glory be to Christ. Friends, your, your life is a mist. For the people who are, are older in here, and I would include myself in that category to some degree, we, you know your life is a mist. It, it may feel like yesterday you were on the playground, 12, 15, just getting married, having kids, and now you, you look back and you're like, the, the majority of your life is behind you and it can be taken from you at any minute. Brothers and sisters, your life is a mist. Now is the time. If you don't know Christ, come to him. Knock, seek, he will answer. If you know him and you're looking back, stop it. Just stop it. Don't flirt with sin. Don't flirt with whatever you're looking back on. There is only one who can satisfy you. The God-man, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just, we ask that your Holy Spirit uh, fill, in, fill in the gaps of what I said today that maybe didn't make sense or, or didn't connect. Lord, show us about Melchizedek in a way that maybe we just don't see right now. Show us the importance of, of your Holy Scripture, why you include things, why you don't include things. Help us to love your word and to just cling to your word in a way where we, we just look at it and say, okay, you put it there. It, it must mean something. Lord, we love you and we, we pray all these things in, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit vintagefaithcicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.